This is a story about a boy, a boy becoming a young man. David was one of the nicest people I know. A good student, a good friend. If I ever had to talk to somebody about something, I could talk to David about it. He was just like a great guy, so fun. A promising athlete. His baseball coaches used to always tell the other kids to, to watch and emulate David's swing. He was so laid back and like he was friends with everyone. Yeah, nobody, nobody really didn't like him. He was a popular kid. He um, wasn't withdrawn. He, he lived on the edge. He was wild. Um, he loved going out with his friends, partying on the weekends. Just your normal high school boy. David had a girlfriend, caring parents, an older brother who loved him, good teachers, a lot of talent, and a winning personality. He was always happy. He was always affectionate. He always wanted to hug. David Manlove went to Lawrence Central High School, a public school with an outstanding academic reputation, respected faculty. David played on the baseball team, participated in his church youth group, and was confirmed his freshman year. David's prospects were bright, his future promising. It was a happy time to be alive. He um, was a big risk taker too. Like he'd try anything, do anything, just for like, just to say, hey, I've done that. You go to a party or something, you go to somebody's house, you don't expect people just to be sitting around, you know, watching TV or watching a movie, you know, drinking Coke and eating popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> he was hanging out with different people and um, skipping school a lot, and so things started to change. I realized that him and I stopped hanging out as much, and he was always doing some sort of drug or, or drinking all the time. I found a pipe in his room which of course he said oh that belonged to somebody else one time i gave him an option i was like choose me or choose weed and um he told me he'd stop but at that point he was continuing to do well in school he was an athlete he was you know playing baseball i saw it i would i'd be at home and i knew he was messed up i could tell him and he'd tell me and he'd beg me not to tell them and of course I didn't. Wanting to be the cool older brother. We, all of us, like friends can say, David, you know, don't do that, don't do that. But then there's that other group that says, come on, man, do it do with it. us. Yeah. You know, there's another group that he was hanging with that we're doing that stuff. The first that we knew was a very, very serious and very dramatic piece. At that point, that he was still just 15 then. Josh, our older son, woke us up. Um, and, at one o'clock in the morning um, saying that he had just gotten a phone call from uh, David's girlfriend. He and Stacy were having a fight and he was saying something about how sorry he was and how he had really messed things up and Stacy was never going to forgive him and he was going to cut himself. I think it was a combination of both marijuana and alcohol mm -hmm. that he was, you know, just out of uh, out of his head with. Um, his reality was altered uh, to the point where. Yeah, I don't know uh, what what all he had taken right. that night. The very next day was when we went to Fairbanks for an evaluation and were shocked at what they said the extent of his drug use and alcohol use was. Those first moments at Fairbanks are very difficult moments. Uh, you're scared. Uh, you're angry. You're anxious. Um, you're in denial. You're in denial. They said he needed their intensive outpatient program. In a 15-minute assessment, uh, they were able to, uh, because of the types of questions and probing that they, they are, uh, do a very good job of, they had um, come back with a fairly serious uh, level of dependency. We had a family vacation that had been long scheduled and made the decision for the following week and made the decision to go ahead and go on vacation. And we um, spent the next several months actually thinking, again, that we were going to handle it ourselves. But for all their concern, their drug screening, their monitoring, the man loves were soon to discover that their vigilance just wasn't enough. Now, months after David's initial visit, the man loves returned to Fairbanks for help. The very first evening, he, he 
didn't want to be there and thought that, you know, it was a dumb idea and I don't need to be here. I was so amazed that he'd been so forthcoming with right. the assessment counselor. By the end of that very first evening, he did acknowledge that he thought there would be some benefit by the third week, third week. In, into uh, the program. He was acknowledging and saying that he was an addict. One out of every three people in America are affected by addiction in their family. Thinking of addiction as a weakness will not make it go away, nor is it accurate. We now know that addiction is a disease, like diabetes, heart disease, or asthma is a disease. And fortunately, like many other diseases, people with an addiction can learn to treat the disease. And that's why, you know, people come here. That's why David was getting help. He had a craving for things. and. You couldn't do anything about it. David spent an initial eight-week period attending Fairbank's intensive outpatient program and was participating in Fairbank's aftercare program. Ironically, tragically, it may have been David's desire to stay clean, to pass his drug tests, that may have led him to a risk that couldn't be detected in a drug test. He had um, huffed on the phone with me, and I didn't know what it was. Um, and I just, his voice changed and that's all I knew. According to a study by the University of Michigan, trying inhalants, huffing, is the fastest growing category of types of drugs tried by eighth through 10th graders. We didn't know how, power, how, how powerful his desire to get high was, and he didn't know how powerful that desire to get high was. Because of the information we received in the, in the parent education series, and because of the support from the counselors and, and the process of sharing with other families what we were going through, again, I think in many ways that is absolutely what prepared us to understand that a consequence could be that David would die, that, that the disease of addiction is so powerful that that, that is not an unrealistic um, consequence. In describing the rapid progression of the disease of addiction, David's mother told us that 11 months from thinking he was fine, he was gone. The day before David died, I, um, we were all out on uh, Guy's Reservoir, and I saw, I saw him huffing on a boat. And all I did was just ask him, you know, why? Why are you doing that? If there were certain things that he couldn't get, that he would go to a different level to get that high. I know that I know so many people that did say something to David, and I didn't do anything. I took the phone, and it was uh, the mother of a friend. David had been over at their house. She said, David's been at the house, they were in the pool, um, uh, he's unconscious, the kids said he was huffing, he went underwater, the paramedics are here, they're working on him, but they haven't been able to revive him yet. David had been huffing at a friend's home. To intensify the rush, he jumped into their pool, but didn't come up. On the way to, um, to the house, um, I was on the cell phone, uh, trying to get hold of Kim. He was in Arizona visiting his dad. Josh and I got out of the car, and as I'm walking up, I see David on a gurney, and there's a paramedic on top of the gurney, on top of David doing CPR, and somebody walking alongside him with a bag, bagging him. Um, and his feet are blue. That was the first thing I noticed was his feet were blue. Emergency paramedics rushed David to a nearby hospital. At that point, my mother said, you know, he's dead already. I know it, I know it, he's dead. At the hospital, an emergency team continues a frantic attempt to revive David. After what seemed like an eternity to his devastated mother, she could stand no more. I said to the doctor, I need to know. I need to be able to tell my husband that we did everything. That we could. And the doctor said yes. So Josh and I said, then stop, please stop. And they did. 
I was driving home and I pulled out, I pulled my car over the side of the road and I just got out and I just stood there and I just stared like just at the ground and I was just thinking, I was like, man, I was like, is this real or what? I was like, tell me this isn't real, you know? I mean, I was supposed to meet him like two hours ago and now I can't meet him ever. I knew he was dead, but it didn't feel like he was dead until I went to his funeral and I saw his body and it all hit me like a brick wall. It just seemed yeah. that the day would just never end. I kind of felt like if I would have been at the pool that day, I'm a lifeguard and that I could have saved him. We learned the first week um, what Marisa said earlier about uh, chemical dependency and addiction and that it leads to, if it's left untreated, it leads to three things, jails, institutions, and death. And he had, he experienced all three. A young man from a good family, a good school, one of the nicest neighborhoods in town, and we are left with the question of why. Surprisingly, we know why. A serious disease called addiction. A disease that cannot be totally cured, but can be treated successfully for life. What steps might have saved David's life? We know that early detection, treatment, and lifelong efforts toward recovery are essential. Assessment and treatment by caring professionals, like the ones at Fairbanks, literally saves lives every day. Before I even like knew David or whatever, I thought, you know, an addict or an addiction was a time you need to be high all the time. Like a homeless person on the street, being drunk and, you know, walking around asking for money. And um, that changed when I came here um, to a meeting with him. Um, because, you know, people get, people stand up and say they're an addict, but they've been clean for like six years. Some of what we learned is that if the use of alcohol or marijuana or, or whatever the chemical or, or substance of choice is, if it interferes with your daily life, if you spend lots of time planning when you're going to use it, how you're going to use it, who you're using with, what it's going to take in order to get it to use. Those are, those are some of the things that tell you that it's, that it's become a disease. It is said that a person dealing with addiction alone is in bad company. But surrounded by professionals, support groups, and a wide variety of services at treatment centers like Fairbanks, people with a disease can and do live normal, happy, and productive lives. Fairbanks files are full of thousands of such cases. The disease of addiction can develop rapidly, especially in adolescence. That's why it is so important to recognize the signs of addiction and seek help immediately. David's death like, made me realize no matter how many friends you have, no matter how many people love you, no matter where you come from, you can get addicted to drugs easily. And I think if he had an opportunity today to say, here's what I've learned, he would say, I didn't realize how much control this really did have over me. Don't be afraid to tell your friend. Like, you can't worry about your friend getting mad at you for a week or a few weeks, you know, because you try and help them. Because in the long run, would you rather have a friend mad at you for a while or would you rather have no friend? I mean. Really just, if you think there's a problem, don't feel like a rat, don't feel like a narc. You should just tell someone if you feel like they need to get help. Look for things that are out of the ordinary. You know your kid. You know how they're supposed to be. If they're not acting that way, if they're acting differently, you need to check that out. Be vigilant. Um, learn all that you possibly can um, about the signs uh, of drug use and addiction. If you know somebody or if you even think somebody might have a problem, you need to tell somebody. Know that huffing can kill you no matter what. Know that doing ecstasy can kill you no matter what. Know that, you know, acid, you know, whatever. Yeah, no matter how much your friends or family tell you, it won't matter if you don't change. You can't do it by yourself. You need the help of your friends. You need the help of your family. You need the 
help of professional counselors, you need the help of others who've been this path before and understand how hard it is. Take it seriously. I think it takes uh, courage to um, take that first step, uh, to pick up the phone and to schedule an appointment with Fairbanks, but I would say find the courage someplace and make the call. I still do talk to him all the time and you know, I'm just like, David, you know how much I love you and you know how much I miss you and and I just, you know, and I, I don't know, just whenever I'm upset, I, I talk to David. I'm hugging him, like uh -huh. so hard. And it's just, there's no, there's no beginning, there's no end to the dream. It's just, I'm hugging him. Hi, I'm Kim Manlove, David's dad. And I'm Dr. Tim Kelly, medical director of Fairbanks. I imagine some of you who have watched this video may be asking why we are telling David's story. You might be saying, there were no winners here. But this isn't about winning or losing. It's a story about a powerful disease. We knew our son had an addiction, and yet we were unable to save him. The staff at Fairbanks used all of our knowledge and experience about addiction to try and help David. But David's story is not about failure. It's the story of a young man whose lifestyle was similar to countless other teenagers. And when his lifestyle put him in contact with addictive substances, his body's tendency to become addicted was exposed. The medical community at Fairbanks used all of the science and love at our disposal to try to fight his disease, but in the end, David's disease was simply too powerful. Maurice and I didn't want to believe that our perfect son from our perfect family could become addicted. So we were slow to realize the extent of David's use and to realize the power the addiction had over him. Had we realized this sooner, we would have intervened earlier and more forcefully. This delay may have enabled David's addiction to take a hold of him in such a powerful way that all of the knowledge and all of the help that he received at Fairbanks was not enough to prevent him from making a fatal choice. David's story doesn't have a happy ending, but we can honor David's struggle if this video makes you aware of the unbelievable power of addiction. If you're watching this as a parent, a family member, or a friend, we hope we've helped you recognize that you may be unintentionally enabling addiction to take hold by denying the problem. If you're an adolescent, take that first step in admitting that you may have a problem. There are dozens of success stories from the files of Fairbanks that we could have told you. Addiction is not an irreversible disease. People can recover. Many of our patients are living productive lives, but because of the courage of Kim and Marisa Manlove, we are telling you the story of David in the hope that you'll be more closely attuned to the physical and emotional changes that addiction can cause in your life or in the life of someone you love. We will always be grateful to Fairbanks for what they tried to do for David. And more importantly, for what they have done to help us understand and cope with his loss. We can't change what happened to David. What we can do is try and help others deal with the power and the perils of addiction. That is why we do what we do. And why we are sharing with you this story, our story. A story about a boy, a story about our son, David.